I've done a really poor job recently of keeping on top of all the questions that have been coming through on my channel recently, but that's, there's nothing I can do about that. I've been ridiculously busy. I've had a question come through from someone on my Patreon. Uh, it's one of the best questions that I've ever been asked. It's got nothing to do with software. It's actually to do with career choices and how to go about yourself within your career. So that's not something I've ever really discussed on this channel, but I think it's something which could really be touched on a lot more than it has been, uh, providing that there's a, there's a requirement there, I guess. Uh, and this question really touches on that. So if this doesn't apply to, uh, it might not apply to everybody, but I suspect because of the type of channel that I am, there may be a lot of people who either are in this situation or will face this situation in the future. So it's a good question to cover. So the question is, hey Neil, one of your Patreon supporter bros here, hoping to pick your brain for some advice. I'm a freshly minted engineer and a falling into a consulting gig with a Canadian company doing CAD drawing and design for a simple weldment they're trying to bring to the market. I'm taking a physical prototype, their welders mocked up, and modeling it. They also want me to find a few functional and aesthetic additions to the product to make it more marketable. I'm basically a free agent in my arrangement with them, but I'm not sure what rate I should ask for, you know, to be equitable, but also maximizing my earnings. I'm an advanced SolidWorks user, intermediate inventor user, and my hope is to start a personal consulting CAD drafting firm doing work like this. So the question after the uh, setting the scene is, what do you think a fair hourly rate to ask for my services would be? And do you have any tips on general professionalism that I ought to follow in this business other than modeling according to best practice? Yes to all of those questions. So we'll start with the hourly rate. The first thing that came to mind, uh, and actually before I start that, I do apologize for the setting and the poor camera and lighting and audio and stuff. I'm in a hotel. I'm just cracking this video up before I start doing some work myself for the night. Um, so it's not the best video I've ever shot in my life, but it's something I've been thinking about for quite some time and I thought now is a pretty good time to get it done. So the first thing that jumped out with regards to the question here is the guy's asking the rate that he should be pitching for. But at the start of the question he said that he's falling into a, or fallen into a consulting gig with a Canadian company. So it sounds like the, the work's been agreed that he will do the work, but money hasn't been discussed yet. So I'm not too sure how that came about. In contracting, you would normally agree the rate before you would then commit to saying, yes, I'll do it. Unless it's some kind of, you know, mates type of a deal, like a gentleman's agreement where they've said, look, the gig's yours if you want it. We are, we're not really looking for anyone else. It's yours. We'll talk about money later on type of a deal. Could be like that. So with regards to the actual hourly rate that you go for, there's no answer to that, unfortunately. I can kind of guide you into a direction or anybody into a direction that you can possibly be thinking about just to sort of set expectations but the rate that you actually settle on depends on so many factors i mean there's a load of different factors the first thing and the most obvious thing is the type of work that you're doing if it's just drafting work and just modeling work as valuable as that work is there is a lot more people going in for jobs like that so the rate is slightly lower because the the employers or the clients they tend to have more they, they've got the upper hand with that when they've got more choice Whereas with engineers, fewer engineers out there, there's fewer people going for the positions, and those people have, you know, they might they may have degrees in engineering, whereas the draftsman may, may not have degrees. They might have experience on big projects, whereas the draftsman may not have that kind of a high level experience. So with engineers, you can pitch for a higher hourly rate. Now, if the next thing, and just as important as that first thing, is where you're located. Now, he did say in this question that he's in Canada, or the, the company's in Canada. It doesn't mean he is, but the company is. So, the rates in Canada could be completely different to what the rates are in the UK. And off of a very basic Google search, it actually seems like that is the case. Over in the UK, an engineer in mechanical uh, engineering can expect something in the region of, I would say, roughly 40 to 50 pound an hour in the northeast of England, even down south in London though, the rates change yet again and go much higher. So it can't even depend where you are in the country, let alone which country it is. So what I did, I went over to uh, Google and did a search for Canadian engineering contract rates and the, one of the very first links that came up was a link to a PDF from the Alberta Consulting Engineers, Engineers Rate Guideline and that was pretty straightforward, came up quite quickly. So whichever country you're in, if you can just do a search for US engineers contract rate guideline or Spanish contract rate guideline, something like that, there may be a document out there which will tell you what the rate guideline, and it is just a guideline. You cannot go to an employer with a guideline and say, 
Uh, says I should be getting uh, $150 an hour, so uh, stump up, because they'll just tell you to do one. Doesn't really work like that, it's like used car prices, isn't it? Just because a book says your car's worth something, doesn't mean you're getting that. So this Canadian engineer's, engineer's rate guideline is quite surprising actually, I wouldn't have guessed this. So there's, the, the rate's been broken into tiers. There's tier uh, E1 all the way up to E6, actually no, it's tier A all the way up to F. Tier A is an engineering student. So you've, you've just left university and you've got your first job type of a contract. You're gonna struggle to get a contract if you are a student engineer or a graduate engineer. Companies take on contractors because they don't wanna train people. They don't wanna to have to go through the learning curve for staff. They just wanna bring someone in who's experienced to get a job done and then job's done, contractor moves on. That's the whole point of contracting. So engineering students on a contract are pretty rare, but for the Alberta guidelines, they're saying $100 an hour all the way up the scale to a tier F, which you're talking engineering managers, you're talking project directors, you're talking the highest level of an engineer within a project. Uh, you could protect, I mean, you, you don't really get contract directors. Well, actually, I've seen contract directors before. Very rare, but you can get them. And that's at $360 an hour. So you're looking for an engineer between $100 to $360 an hour in Canada. Now there's another scale here, this is for technical services. This will be for draftsmen or uh, modelers, anyone just doing, uh, you know, not necessarily admin work, but uh, not, the, not the engineering side of things, it is more drafting. So this is on another scale, T1, T7. The first is $105 an hour for an entry level draftsman. They've described this tier as under close supervision, carries out straightforward duties such as preparing uncompleted or repetitive drawing maintaining drawing files and assisting with field survey. So it's basically your entry level drafting work, which doesn't really require any great deal of thought or calculations from the draftsman himself or herself. All the way up to a T7, which in, is described as someone who independently represents the company with clients on an ongoing basis, manages and supervises staff on a continual basis, so on, so on, so on, manages major projects. So this is a lead draftsman almost encroaching into an engineer's role, but it's someone who's much more hands-on, deals with clients, and that's uh, the high level of the technical services scale coming in at $219 an hour guideline. So for a draftsman, between $105 and $219 an hour. So that's kind of a guideline as to what you can be looking at. Where you fit on that scale, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I can't say where you would fit on that scale, but it is a guideline as to where you can possibly pitch yourself at least you know not to undersell yourself at 40 or 50 dollars an hour or oversell yourself at 500 dollars an hour at least you kind of know where to pitch it at uh, other things that the rate depends on as well is the kind of contract that it is is it a long-term contract is it a short-term contract if it's a sh very very short-term contract you can maybe justify putting a premium on the rate to make it worth your while accepting a shorter contract there are times where you'll take on a contract and you'll refuse other contracts. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. If you take on this contract, you're losing out on the opportunity to take on other contracts and you're, you're missing opportunities. So you can put a premium on the contract that you are going to go for to make it worth your while uh, to not get those other contracts. That's not to say the client that you're going with will give a toss that you've missed out on other contracts. They don't care, but you'll have to factor that in when you, you know, pitch for the work. Other things to think about, uh, whether you want an hourly rate or a day rate, that's another thing to think about. There are pros and cons to both. The client might not be happy with either or. The client might just say, look, we want an hourly rate, we'll pay you per hour based on how long you work. But some contracts, they, they're fine with a day rate. And some people prefer a day rate, some people prefer an hourly rate. It's entirely down to personal preference as well. Other things to consider, uh, the region or the country that you're in, you've got to think about the taxes. It's all well and good saying, you know, Canada, uh, people getting 100 and, 100 to 360 dollars an hour that sounds like an absolute stonking deal i'm going to be rolling in the money but who knows what the country taxes are for canada i i don't know maybe it's a 50 percent tax maybe it's a 70 percent tax i have no idea so you'll have to think about that as well when you're kind of budgeting how much you're going to get before you start getting carried away with planning that next aston martin or the lamborghini you're going to buy with all this money you're going to get so just i guess to wrap it up wrap up the uh the talk about money the last thing i would just recommend that anyone does who's thinking about getting into to contracting is that it, you get paid more as a contractor for a good reason and that reason is that the jobs are far more insecure or your work life is far more insecure than it is when you're staff that's not to say everyone's safe as staff that's not true I've come across people very recently in what I deemed as being the most secure of positions that I've ever heard of 
and they've been made redundant. I'll not mention any names, that's not fair, but people like you would just think that's the safest job in the world and they've been made redundant as staff. But as a contractor, you're more disposable than staff. So you're, you tend to be first out the door when you're a contractor. So when, when it comes to money, you need to make sure that your rate is gonna allow you to bank enough money to make sure that if there is any downtime in your, in your employment, that you've got enough money there to cover the bills when things go wrong. Uh, and definitely, absolutely do not charge $200 an hour and live to $200 an hour. That is that probably the biggest mistake anyone could make. You've got to make sure you put money aside for taxes and money aside for if uh, your, your contracts ever dry up and you need some money just put aside to pay the bills. It's all well and good bragging to people, oh, you know, I get $200 an hour, but you don't live to $200 an hour. You live to a, you live to a, a very, very sizable percentage of that, but not all of it. Okay, the next part of the question was any tips on general professionalism? Most of this is just common sense. Uh, when it comes to general professionalism as a contractor, the best bit of advice that I could give anyone if they're thinking about being a contractor is to just don't become a drama queen. Don't become a pain in the ass to the client. It's very easy for contractors to get caught up in the I'm my own boss mentality. You're not really, because when you go work for a client, someone will hire you someone will give you work and someone can fire you. Now, I don't know about you, but in my book, that means that you've got a boss. Now, when you walk away from that company and you're doing your own accounts, you're planning your next contract, yes, I guess in that sense, you are your own boss. You can dictate whether or not you go to work the next day. You don't have to, you know, it's obviously it's polite and it's, it's to the book to tell them in advance that you're not gonna turn up to work. But if you don't wanna turn up, you just don't get paid. You don't have to book holiday. You don't have to, uh, to go through the same rigmarole as that staff do. So in that sense, yes, you're, you're your own boss, but when it comes to the things that actually matter, which is being hired and fired, in this game, yes, you do have a boss. It's not like you're working for an online website where you're just taking orders and you truly are your own boss. No, you work in an office, you have a line manager as a contractor who, strictly speaking, is a boss or assumes the role of a boss. So just don't be a dick. Don't go about the office, don't go about yourself with an attitude because that will make you stand out. And people just don't want to deal with that. People just don't have time for that. They don't want to have to deal with that in their working life. So you come across a contractor who's just an absolute nightmare to deal with, they'll just, they'll just be gone. They'll be gone. There's plenty of contractors out there who are very nice. They're just nice guys, nice girls. They'll come in, they'll do a job without any drama, without any hassle, and they can just leave. And then you'll always get that repeat business. That's the next tip is repeat business is one of the most important parts of being a contractor. If you leave every contract on bad terms, you'll, well, first off, you'll not get repeat business from that company. But secondly, word will travel around that you are a nightmare. <laughs> that will happen. But repeat business is probably one of the most convenient and the most beneficial things that you can have as a contractor. At the end of every contract, if you're, if you're getting guaranteed contract extensions, then you've got guaranteed work. You're not having to go around trying to find work every six months or every 12 months. And if you're cutting ties and burning bridges with the companies you've worked for in the past, then you're not gonna get that repeat business and you're gonna find yourself having to find new work every single six or 12 months at the end of every contract. And that is something which personally I couldn't be bothered to deal with. I've come across plenty of examples of how people should not go about doing things. Uh, even though, even though, and this is, this is quite, I guess, something which is up for debate and up for discussion, even though some people have strictly followed the line of what a contractor is entitled to do, it's just not the right thing to do. For example, you work as a contractor in a company, you develop a bit of software that you truly believe is your own intellectual property. And if the person who knows who I'm talking about is watching this, I do apologize. I'm using you as a textbook example. You were a douchebag and I'm pretty sure you, you probably realize that, uh, but I'm not gonna name any names. So if the contractor's developing a bit of software and they genuinely believe that their company, the contractor's company owns the IP for that software, then they start to go, All right, okay, well, you're gonna, well, I'm gonna license it to you, even though you've paid me in my hourly rate, and whilst you've been paying me my hourly rate, I've developed this software for you, so you're paying for my time. I've written this program, I think I own this program, and I'm gonna you know, charge it back to you, or in 12 months time, you're gonna need me for it to work. If I'm not here, I'm gonna make it stop working, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a bit of code in it which makes it stop working if I'm not around. Those kind of things, although, if it, if it would probably have to go to court to prove whether or not that person was in the right to do that, why would you do that? Why, why would you do that? Even though it is, as a contractor, your right, potentially, to, to take ownership of that IP, if the company you're working for 
doesn't see it the same way, why bring up the conflict? Just, just be a nice guy. Just being a nice guy, although it might cost you a few quid or a few dollars in the long run, it's going to get you repeat business, and that repeat business will definitely outweigh the, the, the cons of just giving up a bit of intellectual property, for example. I would like to think that most of this is just common sense, though. Just be a nice guy. Don't be confrontational. Don't be arrogant. Don't be, you know, don't come across with attitude because I'm a contractor. I'm my, I'm my own boss. I own a business. I can do what I want. I can work when I want. That kind of attitude isn't going to get you anywhere. Just to a certain degree, behave like staff. Blend in like staff. Talk to people like staff. Just go about yourself like you are staff, but you're not and you'll, you'll reap the benefits of that in the long run with your big hourly fat rate. But yeah, you don't get holidays, you don't get sick pay, you don't get, you know, in some cases you don't get to go to the Christmas party, you don't get the pension, you don't get a lot of the perks that staff do, but you'll get that repeat business and your inflated hourly rate will, you know, it outweighs the, the, the perks that you don't get. You can kind of, t you can get your own perks, you can pay for your own perks. So yeah, like I said, a lot of the tips on professionalism just tend to be common sense. Just don't be don't be confrontational, don't be arrogant. Just please the client, that's it. Just, just do what you need to do to keep the client happy and then they'll come back to you. That repeat work will, in the long term, be financially more beneficial to you than, you know, just penny pinching along the way. Anyway, that'll do it for this one. That should hopefully answer that question. There's a lot more to talk about on this topic, I would imagine, but um, I think for now, that answers that question hopefully and uh, this might give it might just be food for thought for a few people who might be thinking about going down the the contract route it's it's scary it is, it is a scary thing to do to leave a staff role and go into a contract role but if you go about it the right way um, there's there's a lot of benefit to get from it anyway guys thanks a lot and I'll see you in the next one toodles